let's start now uh, talking about passive foreign investment companies. The obvious first question is, what was the condition before there were PFIX? Because PFIX uh, have not been around all that long. They came in, uh, if I remember correctly, with the 86 Reform Act. So if we compare PFIX to CFCs, which have been around since 1962, or what no longer is with us, the, for the Foreign Personal Holding Company, uh, which was repealed in 2004, That's, that was with us since roughly the mid-1930s. So uh, this is relatively new. What was the condition before? Why was there a, you know, why was there a need? Uh, I'm indicating that you had all these happy campers, so to speak, all these happy U.S. persons, because they were able to own interest in a foreign company that could earn passive income that would defer any U.S. taxation until sometime in the future when they, for example, either receive the distribution, which they probably wouldn't, because that would, of course, eliminate the benefit of deferral if they received current distributions. And then further, when they did decide to sell this, they'd end up with capital gains. And remember, a long time ago, there were very, very uh, high ordinary income rates and, relatively speaking, low capital gain rates. So this trade-off between uh, ordinary income and capital gain was a very, very significant thing. Now, if you are a detailed-oriented person, you'll notice that there are 11 of those little figures. There's 11 different owners, and we're of course assuming that they are not related to each other. And because there are 11 of them, each one owning exactly 9 point something percent, these 11, none of them are U.S. shareholders for purposes of subpart F. So this company, even if all of these 11 are US persons, this is not a controlled foreign corporation under the subpart F rules. So what did the 1986 Act do? How did it try to penalize this kind of situation? Essentially, what they did was to force the owners who are U.S. persons, any owner that's a U.S. person, is forced to calculate an additional amount of tax and an interest charge at the time when this thing is either sold or when a certain let's say, larger than average distributions are made. So the idea is define something which is, you know, a distribution or a sale, which is obvious, that obviously has had deferral benefits. In other words, that there's been a, an allowance uh, of money build up from passive income in the inside the company, primarily passive income. Oh, you know, that gets built up to the extent there's a distribution or a sale of the shares that in essence allows a realization of earnings that have been just sitting in that company for some number of years, then penalize that situation. An important 
point here is that uh, this, uh, we show in this example that all 11 are U.S. persons because they're, they're crime. You know, if they were non-U.S. persons, they wouldn't care. But here we show them all crime, so they must all be U.S. persons. But even if only one of those persons were U.S., he would still be crying. There is no minimum amount of ownership before these rules come into play. So even if there's only one person and he only owns 0.1% of the company, he's covered by this rule. Again, from a mechanical standpoint, it's hard for the U.S. government to attack a non-U.S. company directly. So the mechanism focuses on taxability of the shareholder who is a U.S. person who is within easy reach. Now, another interesting point is that under normal circumstances, all of you know, because of your corporate course and some other things that, of course, we've talked about in here, that in order to know whether a distribution with respect to stock is a dividend, you have to know what the earnings and profits are. Now, in the case of a controlled foreign corporation, which has more than 50% U.S. ownership by U.S. shareholders, you know, 10% or greater shareholders, there's a reasonable assumption, because of that U.S. control, that those parties having some common interest in knowing what the earnings and profits are inside that company, they will uh, they will do what's necessary to get that information. Because as a group, they all need it. And they, as a group, own over 50%. But here, there might be only one U.S. person who owns 0.1% of the company. If that's the case, what ability does that individual have that owner what ability did, what ability does that owner have who owns only 0.1% of the company to get the information necessary to decide what is a dividend to get the information necessary to know what the earnings and profits are so he can figure out whether he's received a dividend or not well the practical aspect is that you can't assume that some very minority investor is going to have the power to be able to get that information. So therefore, the computation, which we will not go into uh, particularly, but the computation under 1291, which defines you know, what the taxable amount will be and uh, what the tax will be and the interest charge, that depends solely on how much money is distributed, has nothing to do with any reference to earnings and profits. Everywhere else in the code, when a distribution is made, you figure out the character by looking to earnings and profits and you know this sort of thing. You look to the 301 rules. 316 and you, you look at those things here it's only the cash distributed or other property distributed so it's a very pragmatic approach shareholder is not going to know this information so therefore don't create a practical problem by forcing him to 
obtain information that he cannot in any way obtain. I think it's worthwhile to uh, point out a, a few items of comparison between the PFIC rules and the subpart F rules, because they, they take a very, very different stance. The mechanism of attacking the shareholder, who is a US person, of course, is similar to both and makes you know, just wonderful good sense because the U.S. person is in fact easily grabbable by the U.S. government. But in other areas, there's a lot of difference. So, uh, first thing in terms of owners, PFIC, anybody who owns an interest in the uh, PFIC is covered by these rules. In the case of a CFC, it's only 10% or greater shareholders. So, significant difference there. Timing. PFIC, unless you make one of several elections that we'll talk about, under the PFIC rules, nothing happens until there's an actual distribution, which under a calculation is an excess distribution, or until the shares are sold. or the shareholder borrows money and uh, uses the shares as, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as security for the loan. So currently, nothing need happen. The PFIC ownership just sits there and until something actually happens, excess distribution or sale, no effect on the shareholder. With the CFC, though, the whole concept is current taxability by the uh, U.S. shareholder of his pro rata share of any subpart F income. So it's a current thing. Year by year, to the extent there's subpart F income, the U.S. shareholder has to recognize things, whether he receives money or not. So again, quite a difference in terms of structure. And then the last point, what earnings are covered? The CFC rules are very careful to say, OK, there will only be this 951 income inclusion, pro rata subpart F income for certain defined categories. If the CFC earns income which do not uh, income which does not fall within any of those categories, then there's deferral. Deferral is allowed, period. And there's no penalty for having deferral. When there's a distribution in the future or a sale of shares, there's no extra penalty tax. Okay, there's rules as to, uh, you know, is it a dividend? Uh, considered a dividend uh, or capital gain, uh, there's that, but there's not a penalty from the standpoint of charging you even more money. With a PFIC though, if a PFIC meets either the income or assets test, which we'll mention in a moment, if it meets either of those tests, 100% of whatever is in that PFIC is, uh, let's say, you know, to the extent there's earnings and to the extent there's distributions out of it, these, uh, let's say, penalty costs under 1291 uh, are imposed. Even though there may have been no, in, uh, absolutely zero uh, tax motivation for what's been done, uh, this extra amount is, is imposed under the 1291 tax computation and interest charge. So you meet the test, you're stuck with the result even though there's, let's say, non-offending activities inside the company. 
another interesting aspect, I don't think it's included on any of the slides, but uh, it, it basically, if a company is a PFIC, it's sort of a PFIC for the years that it qualifies as a PFIC forever. And we'll always have that taint for owners of the company that were owners during those years. Okay, so what is a PFIC? There's a you know, gross income test, there's a you know, gross asset test, and the, uh, the percentages, 75% or more of the gross income is passive income is defined. And this is a year-by-year -year test. Uh, or 50% or more of the assets are passive income assets. So these are uh, relatively simple, straightforward tests. What's the income? What are the assets? Either one, you know, hitting, getting to that 50% or 75% for one of the tests is all you need to be a PFIC. You don't have to meet both. You're a PFIC if either one is met. Now, for passive income, as defined, interestingly, just like the foreign tax credit limitation rules for the passive basket, just as they referred to the 954C foreign personal holding company income definitions, that's exactly what uh, 1297 does as well in defining uh, what is passive income. So you see that that listing of, uh, of a number of different types of income in uh, 954C is used for three major purposes. Foreign tax credit limitation calculations, subpart F itself of course, and the PFIC uh, rules. For the assets test, uh, generally it's a fair market value test, but under certain circumstances you could use book value. Now, as you might imagine, if you have a, uh, an active business that has relatively low uh, low asset levels, for example, a service business. A service business might have a lot of, you know, tables and chairs and computers, but relatively speaking, that's not a lot of value. What asset might a service business have? Well, maybe they have some sort of know-how or goodwill. Well, those are assets. And those are business assets. So on a fair market value basis, putting a value to that can be rather important if you're trying to avoid this 50% 50 uh, 50 of assets test. And it means also that you have to use a, a value test as opposed to a uh, tax basis test because generally your goodwill and your know-how and those sorts of intellectual properties, generally they have a tax basis of zero. So uh, this can be a, uh, uh, it can be a, an issue. Uh, for the assets and income tests, there's a, uh, what I'll call a vertical look-through rule. In other words, if, if a company has a subsidiary, then what are the assets and income of the subsidiary? So as long as it's 25% or more ownership, then you look through when you do your calculations for uh, uh, either the income or assets test.
Now, what's the consequences of PFIC ownership to a U.S. person? Uh, I had said that, uh, I had said I, I, in my discussion so far, I've only referred to the, what I'll call the default rule of 1291. 1291 is where it's saying uh, there's going to be this particular tax calculation involved if you have an excess distribution or if you have a, distri uh, a distribution, I'm sorry, a disposition of the shares. That's your default rule. But there are a couple of options which might or might not be available to a U.S. person that owns an interest in the PFIC. Let's uh, speak a little bit about first this QEF uh, and then mark to market. What are they about? Uh, the qualified electing fund concept is that an owner of a PFIC, if he does not want to be covered by the default rule because the default rule is so terrible or might be so terrible, a shareholder can decide to elect this qualified electing fund status if he can get the information necessary to calculate his U.S. tax using the approach. So we'll talk in a moment as to what that is, but the point is that the shareholder can only make this election if he actually has access to information that about the results of operations of the PFIC. And again, a lot of times an owner will not have that. So they cannot make this election. But where it is possible to make it because there is access to this information, what is the result? Well, essentially, just like any U.S. mutual fund, which, uh, which gives information to all mutual fund holders as to what their share is of capital gains, what their share is of dividends and interest received by the fund during the, uh, during the uh, taxable year. This same information is what uh, this person is electing to uh, use as reporting on his U.S. tax return. So, for example, if a, uh, if a PFIC happens to be a, uh, essentially a mutual fund, which is, just happens to be uh, formed in the Cayman Islands instead of uh, under Delaware law. And if the management of that PFIC agrees to provide the information, then to the extent that that fund buys and sells securities during the year and realizes capital gain or loss receives some dividends, you know, has some interest income, maybe has some management expenses. The results of those things flow through under this election to the owner. So the owner will put down on his Schedule D on Form 1040 for capital gains. This is my share from this PFIC. He'll put into his dividend income this is my share of dividends. This is my share of interest. So these things flow through. And this is a shareholder election. You might have one PFIC where they're providing this information and there's two U.S. persons who own. One person might elect this QEF status. Another person might say, you know, I just want the default rule. 
or maybe that other person never actually makes the decision. He just never elects the QEF status. Yes, Peter. Um, what are some of the factors that go into the decision as to whether the company or the fund or whatever is going to provide information? Okay, that, that's a good question. Uh, uh, as a practical matter, I would say uh, the primary thing is the management of the fund looking to seek, uh, seek U.S. persons as owners. If they're going to actively market this to U.S. investors as well as investors in England or France or Japan or other, you know, other countries, then they, in a sense, need to take account of the needs of the U.S. investors. On the other hand, if they say worrying about not only tax issues but SEC uh, obligations and so on, you know, I, I'm just not going to go for U.S. investors then uh, they may well decide not to. And if they happen to get a US investor, then that US investor is just not going to get that information. Uh, Ricardo, it looked like you were going to say you know, something. Because I read it the other day in an um, article saying that after the bailout, all the islands that they have been pressured to follow certain standards, either the IFR, IFRS or Preferably, they would follow the, the new accounting standards to provide more information because it was just no one actually knew what's, what was inside all of those, those islands. So the islands have been changing their rules to provide more information to like be more diligent and like, some sort of due diligence on, on the... Yeah, no, that's, that's right. There's a couple of areas that have been, uh, let's say, over the uh, past, depending on issue, let's say five to 20 years or so. One, uh, one issue, which is what you're raising, is the accounting rules. Uh, we have, uh, that a few of you uh, perhaps know and love, U.S. generally accepted accounting principles which have been around a long time and which have, uh, let's say, relatively, relatively speaking, clear standards on what you're supposed to do in terms of uh, financial statement disclosure. The IFRS, which uh, stands for uh, 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 International Financial Reporting Standards, uh, these have been uh, developed over the past 30, 40 years, 50 years, and more and more countries have been adopting them and their disclosure requirements. So yes, there's more information coming out. The other thing which has been uh, happening over the past roughly 10 years or so is that spurred very much by the OECD, there's been a great effort at changing uh, local, what I'll call uh, secrecy rules, to uh, you know, and encouraging countries to get into exchange of information agreements, so that some of this non-transparency and secrecy, which had uh, had been at the heart of a lot of these you know tax haven companies or tax haven countries, uh, is less and less an issue. So. That's been that's been going on for roughly ten years or so. So yeah, you're absolutely right, Ricardo, in terms of uh, this this kind of thing. Now, with regard to the uh, qualified electing fund, again, a U.S. person can only elect it if he can get the information, and that really means getting it from the management of the uh, QEF. Now the second, uh, the second one, which is the mark-to-market alternative, which is uh, your section 1296. There you have to have a company, you know, a PFIC, which in fact has marketable shares. You know, there's a stock exchange 
involved. Now, if the particular PFIC, uh, PFIC is marketable, if its shares are traded so that you know what fair market value is, then the shareholder can elect this alternative treatment. And this alternative treatment basically says, what's the value at the day you buy it? You know, you buy that company, uh, buy the interest in that company. What is the value at the end of the taxable year? Did it go up? Did it go down? If it went up, ah, you have income to that extent, and it's ordinary. If the following year it goes down a bit, well, then you can reduce your income through an ordinary deduction to reflect that loss in value, but you can't go below your cost. So, you, you know, as value goes up or down, you include an income. Your, your poor, you know, your, the change, uh, positive or negative, of fair market value of your holding. So you have three very different regimes. The default regime, which is really beating you over the head uh, with potential tax cost and an interest charge. You have this qualified electing fund where it's sort of like a, a normal mutual fund in the United States where uh, the owner is given information on what's his share of capital gains, ordinary income, and so on. Or this you know, real marketable interest where you include currently the increase or decrease in value. So you've got those three alternatives. But again, depending on the, it depends on the PFIC itself as to whether or not any particular shareholder has an ability to choose something other than the default rule. If management will not provide the information, and if it's not a, you know, a marketable uh, obligated, uh, marketable share on an exchange, <coughs> then the owner is stuck with the default rule and has no choice. Okay, so this slide is getting at what is the default rule and what is the, the cost. And I think the important point here is that notice uh, in the first bullet point under cost the U.S. person of this deferral achieved, it says calculate tax as if the income earned over the years of deferral and taxed at the highest marginal rate for each year. Now, are all of you uh, presently in the highest tax bracket? Do you have hopes of being at some point? Do you think you will be every year? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. But uh, the point is that the amount of income that a person has, you know, can go up or down. Well, if you have something less than the maximum marginal rate, then this is an absolutely terrible result because you're going to be taxed at that 35% rate even if in that year you were at the 15% rate. So this is, uh, is really for somebody who's not in the maximum bracket every year, a very, very significant tax increase. Okay, I think we've already talked a bit about uh, the QEF and the 1296, so we'll, we'll pass, uh, pass over those. Where there's a choice, 
which one might be better? In other words, uh, if you have, uh, let's say you had, for example, a, a fund that was a marketable fund because it was on an exchange, and also the management is willing to provide the information. So in that kind of a situation, a, an owner, a shareholder of that PFIC, has three options available to it. Default, QEF, and the you know, marketable, uh, uh, mark the market trend, uh, mark the market method. So three possibilities. So which should a person choose? Well, there, what factors are there that we need to look at? And then we can you know, look at the, at the slide more closely. But one thing I've already mentioned, what's the tax bracket of the owner? Is this a, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Kristen, maybe you're, uh, you know, you were just smiling, you know, when I asked about your tax bracket because uh, you're in a low tax bracket, but, you know, your, uh, your parents, you know, have this trust fund available for you and you, uh, you know, you know that it's, uh, it's going to go up later, but, uh, you know, you can leave that, you know, in trust and you're not going to get any, uh, uh, you're going to stay in that low bracket for a while. Okay, well, if you invest in, in this, in a PFIC and you're at this low bracket because of your trust uh, and uh, gift planning that your, uh, your parents have done for you, then you probably don't want to, to be under the default method. So that's one thing. What, what is that, uh, uh, what bracket is the owner? Okay, what else might there be? Uh, what about the nature of the investments inside the PFIC? Are they investments that are expecting to earn primarily from capital gains? Or are they investments which are primarily expected to earn dividends or interest? What, what's the nature of those investments? If you have a, uh, a company which uh, Uh, if you have a company which, uh, uh, for example, is only going to uh, earn interest and dividends and there's not going to be any capital gain, then uh, the option of current taxation under the QEF rule, which allows you flow through treatment for capital gains, might not be so important to you. On the other hand, maybe, you know, maybe uh, you, Kristen, have capital loss carry forwards. And it's very important to you to have that capital gain classification to the extent, in fact, there are capital gains because you're not going to pay any tax on capital gains because you're using a capital loss carry forward. So, You've got to look really at the tax status of the owner and at the nature of what's inside the PFIC. With that information, you can sort of analyze and say, well, gee, what makes sense, assuming I have a choice? Ah, foreign tax credit position of the U.S. person. I've uh, noticed that, uh, yes, one thing we didn't mention is that uh, if you have a qualified electing fund and if that PFIC pays any foreign taxes, those taxes flow through. Those taxes flow through. So if uh, there are going to be foreign taxes, the QEF might give you a better answer than either the default rule or, uh, uh, or the, uh, uh, the mark-to-market rule. 
uh, in the right situation. So anyway, again, the point, you have to really do a separate analysis for each one. Okay, well, uh, that's, uh, yes, uh, Glenn. So, um, in the event that you've got all three of these options available, um, it seems more favorable than uh, subpart F under a CSC. Is that a correct assessment? Okay, well, uh, I'll, let me uh, step back. You do, and this is, this is an important point, so thank you for bringing it up. You do not have a choice as to whether you are covered by the CFC regime or the PFIC regime. The only way you have a choice is if you decide to own uh, no problem. Uh, the only way you actually have a choice uh, is if you, for example, decide to own only 9.9% instead of 10%. And the company is otherwise a CFC because of other U.S. shareholders. Yes, you can have a company which is both a PFIC and a controlled foreign corporation, but for all practical purposes, the uh, a person who is a U.S. shareholder and subject to the CFC rules is going to be subject to those rules in preference to the uh, PFIC rules. Uh, yes, uh, Jessica. When you potentially have all three options, when would you choose uh, mark to market over QEF? Because it seems like the flow-through benefits of the uh, well, I think uh, if you had all three, uh, I mean, my, my expectation is that there would be pretty few people who would want the mark-to-market -market approach uh, if they had the QEF rule instead. Uh, because at least with the QEF, you know, let's say, what the investment philosophy of the fund is. You, you don't have, in a sense, uh, uh, an inability to control what's hitting you, what's hitting your tax return. Uh, uh, yes, it's possible that uh, if that, uh, if that, uh, uh, if that fund had realized capital gains that were much higher than expected, really did wonderfully, well, you know, you'd be pretty happy because those are realized capital gains. Those are not mark-to-market capital gains inside the fund. Those are realized capital gains. On the other hand, with a mark-to-market uh, election, it's not realized. If there's a big run-up in the market through December of the year, and then the market goes to hell, so to speak, in January, tough luck. You have a whole bunch of ordinary income, and maybe you'll have a, a big deduction next year. But this is totally unrealized in the mark-to-market mark thing. So I think if, you're, if there were really a choice, yes, I don't think you'd see it too often. If there is not, a, if the only choice is between the default rule and mark to market, then uh, it may well be that yes, you say, gee, uh, the default rule is so bad for me because you know maybe I'm in a lower bracket because of all the tax planning I've done. Uh, you know, all of my real income is inside uh, tax-exempt annuities, you know, and that's deferred until, uh, you know, I'm, what is it, uh, 79 and a half or whatever the rules are under the annuity, uh, uh, annuity rules. Uh, so uh, you may, 
say, gee, I, I'm better off with that mark to market in preference to the default rule. Uh, any other? Uh, yes, Glenn. So, um, if uh, if you have uh, there's an advantage to staying below uh, U.S. shareholder percentage, assuming there's mark to market available or QEF available. That could be since you have the potential to have some of your income at a 15 percent tax rate, where you don't under. So part of is that fair? Well, no, no. If you're uh, if you're under sub, okay, okay, yes. I'm sorry. If you have uh, uh, if you are under subpart F, then you're right. Any subpart F inclusion will not uh, for an individual owner, individual U.S. shareholder, will not be uh, allowed that 15% qualified dividend rate. Uh, so. The, uh, the point is that uh, if you have a QEF election, then number one, the capital gain portion, yes, can get the 15% capital gain rate. And then uh, there's a question as to whether uh, whatever flows through uh, in terms of the dividends, whether those would be uh, qualified dividends or not. Uh, I have not looked specifically at that before. My guess is that uh, probably they would not be qualified dividends, uh, but that's, that's a guess. 